Hello, world, and welcome to this fourth episode of God Said Give Them Drum Machines Behind the Scenes podcast. I'm your boy, Reggie Dokes, and I'm so excited. First of all, Happy New Year. And speaking of New Year, we're going to start it off right by honoring the great Mr. Eddie Folks. That's right. This entire episode is dedicated to our boy from the D, Mr. Eddie Flashing folks. Now joining me are two producers from the full length documentary. We have Miss Jennifer Washington and Mr. David Grandison. And also we have our great director of this fine documentary, Mr. Christian Hill. So without further ado, let's uh, get into my first hot pick. Of course, it's going to be Mr. Eddie folks. This one is called Check It Out on City Boy Music. Let's go. Dave Grandison, one of the producers on the project, and I want to let you hear a, a, a bite from Eddie Folks, you know, one of the originators of, of Detroit techno, you know, the art form we know as techno. Um, this clip was recorded at the first Detroit Electronic Music Fest, was which was really one of the places that I started my journey in documenting and archiving the originators of electronic music. You know, I took a pilgrimage to Detroit and really just was capturing people at the Detroit Electronic Music Festival in 2000, you know, really speaking to all the originators and uh, really trying to, to, to discover what Detroit techno was. And I, I ran into Eddie and, and Eddie w- was, you know, as he always is, like, yo, yo, let me, let me tell you what's up. <laughs> and he really went into his, his brand of outspoken, you know, brash uh, and and very much insightful overview of what he felt techno was. And this is kind of how he summed it up. So so I felt this was great for us to really um, let you hear this. So um, this is Eddie Folks from the year 2000 at the Detroit Electronic Music Fest. Techno is just, just some ghetto shit that motherfuckers put some groove to. <laughs> Basically. And I love that clip, Dave. My name is Jennifer Washington, and I'm the producer of the upcoming feature link documentary, God Said, Give Them Drum Machines, The Story of Detroit Techno. That was a great backstory with the clip. I mean, when I first saw it, I knew that we had to use it in the film, and it's been in and out of different versions of our different rough cuts, and I've always really fought to keep it in because we never really had any other artist really explain and, like, define you know, in, you know, in simple terms, what techno is. It's always really more of a long, drawn out explanation, but he really put it in a way that I could understand. And our, I know our people can understand. So I felt like it, it was important to include it in this piece as well. It has been an honor and a privilege to document this scene and package it in a way for future generations to enjoy. And this year on our Behind the Scenes podcast, I want to take the time to highlight certain individuals and explain how they fit into the whole grand scheme of things and why they are important to the story. Eddie is one of these individuals. Beyond all of the work that Eddie put in back in the day, he has been a key figure behind the production of this film by connecting us to other important key figures like Kevin Saunderson and Blake Baxter. Up next, we're going to listen to director Christian Hill's recent interview with Eddie Folks, the godfather of Techno Soul.
Yeah, man. How's it going in, in, in Detroit for you, man? Like COVID times, man. I see you've been like really doing a lot of music, man. But uh, other than that, man, how, how have you been holding up? That's all I can do. That's all I can do is, is do that and, and do that. And that's all I can do. I mean, you know, I'm, you know me, I'm not trying to catch that bullshit. You know, I already got some, you know, some health conditions already. Mm-hmm. Predisposed health conditions. That. So I was basically hibernating. If I go anywhere, man, I'm like, I've been like maybe Kenny Dixon crib, no Tally crib. That's about it. But other than that, man, I'm at, I'm at the crib or at Bellout Beach all, all summer. Mm-hmm. I was at the beach all summer. So this this episode we recording this interview for is uh, New Year's Day. In addition to some uh, us talking about what's going on now, I had just had some feel good throwback moments. And uh, one of them, bro, is uh, I want you to talk about uh, your early years as a DJ, like and, and procure and getting your equipment and stuff like that, your records, because uh, Steve Dunbar tells a story about you. He says that uh, growing up when y'all was at uh, WC3. Yep, yep, yep. Y- y'all would uh, link up and mix over each other's house on occasion. He say he come up your crib and you had the old equipment. You ain't had like the new stuff that right. you know that they normally had. The direct drive guys had, you right. know. Just dude, talk to me about your and like I've even talked, heard you tell a story about how your this whole thing you built is based off a hundred dollar mixer that you know. Your, your mother, your parents bought, and now, you know, years later, you're still doing it. But talk to me about this early equipment, man, and how you kind of got into this, really, you know? Well, it's true what Steve said, uh, you know, because I was transitioning from college to living at old girl, my mom's house, and going back to college, you know. The option was, you can stay here if you have a job or in college. So I said, fuck it, I'm, I'm going to school. I'm not, I don't got time to be working. So I, you know, I had my mixer, her turntable, and a cassette deck, you know what I'm saying? But at times went on, you know, uh, me, I start, I would bang over Art Payne crib because he had all the 12, he had the 12s, he had the mixer. So it's like, Art and Keith was like my brother. So it's like, yo man, I'm, I'm about to make this, I want to make a mix on the cassette, you know, this, you know, the Max Hell cassette tape. So I'll just, you know, take my records over there and then, you know, and do that thing. But it was the financial aspect of it. It was like a brother was in, in college, you know. I, I wish I had the Steve Dunbar parent doctor money to, to afford the good equipment. But it is what it is, you know. And like I said, man, it's like the less you have, the more talented you are. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, you don't need a full. Some people think they need a full studio. Some people, they need four CDJs and this and that. Like, man, you know, if you, if, if God chose you, 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 you don't need all that stuff, you know, to, to do what you got to do. But uh, it was cool, man. You know, old girl, she, uh, my mother, she, uh, you know, she bought that mixer, and uh, I went to that Shari Bari party with my sisters, and I saw Daryl Shannon, and I knew what I want, and, and that, you know, predicated to, uh, uh, you know, running into, you know, meeting Derek and you know, in high school, and and he introduced me to Art Payne, so kind of manifests itself all the way through, but. You know, it, it is what it is, man. It's, it was, you know, going back that far, man, it was it was fun. But uh, I think what it was, a lot of people didn't have a lot of gear, you know, because it, it, it wasn't that prevalent, like everybody wanted to be a DJ. So he was kind of special. So I would say that gear, that, I, that old gear that I had, that shit worked because – if I can work on this shit, I can work on the, you know, on the straight arm techniques and the curved arm uh, turn techniques when they come in, when they came in, you know, the pitch control. So, you know, one of such things to slip past back then. So it was cool. Man, you, you also tell that story about when you was at Western and, uh, you know, you was doing, a, Ken was doing a party and after y'all left, you know, the, the, yeah, the Frankie Knuckles. This is the first time you saw Frankie Knuckles, man. And, and you, you thought he's, at the time, Cass was, you know, if his name was Knuckles, that he was kind of spinning on his knuckles, you know. It's like, man, what was that like going to Chicago with Ken and just having that experience as a as a young DJ? Man, I, 
it was dope because, you know, people was like, you know, Magic Wand, Mayday, you know, then I had flashes. So everybody would, you know, uh, I forgot the proper name of that. Uh, when you put that. Moniker. Yeah, the moniker. And, uh, and you were actually, well, we was literally believing the moniker is what you are. And you can do those things. You know, I'm magic. I can watch this magic. You know what I'm saying? So those type of things. So when I went up there to go to school and all that stuff, and then uh, Tony Hunter, remember Tony Hunter? Yeah. I moved in and I said, this ain't the same Tony from Detroit. I was like, no, and it was. So like about two months up there, Ken had played a party up there. And then Tony said, hey, they're going to Chicago. I said, Ben, let's roll. And, you know, they played at the warehouse. <clears throat> and Frankie Knuckles, like, oh, shit, yeah, because you can hear the Hot Mix 5. You can catch the Hot Mix 5 from Kalamazoo in certain nights. So I was like, all right, bet, let's run it. So um, me, Tony, Ken, his girl, uh, these two guys, and a guy named Robert Trotman. You're, you, remember, you know Robert Trotman? Mm-hmm. So we all went, and after Ken playing, it was like 2.30 in the morning, we left. Ken got his loop. Ken had that brown bar, uh, bronco. He got that bronco. We all humped in the, uh, uh, in the back, and he took off. So it was only like halfway to Chicago, from Kalamazoo. <clears throat> and man, I went to that motherfucker, man. And I kept asking Tony, it's going to be some girls there. It's going to be some girls. Yeah, there's going to be some girls there. I said, you been here for that? I've been here before. I didn't know he'd been, he, he been there before. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. So, you know, young motherfucker, 18, I go down there, you know, you go down and, you know, you walk up here and you go down the steps and then you see these lights and they were just like, you know, back then, you know, there ain't no club like in Detroit had no lights like that. And I was like, God damn. So Kim was like, hey man, just stay against the wall, follow the wall, go to DJ booth. Get in the DJ booth, man. I was like, whoa. You know, you see them motherfuckers with them leather shit on, with them black hats. What you call that shit? <laughs> that motorcycle shit. Man, them motherfuckers had clothes on the, and they didn't have clothes in the back, dog. I rushed to that corner. I stayed in that corner all night, dog. But the dope part, I got to see Frankie Knuckles get down for hours. He had two turntables. And uh, he had three turntables. Two here, mixer, turntable here, and he had a real and real. And his record, I never, to this day, I've never seen, uh, his record box was like a Christmas tree. But each level it turns. So he's spinning around. And that shit was dope. And he had the records this way, not this way, this way. And I never, you know, see nobody working. And he was flawless. I mean, he was he was flawless. He was in his in his own backyard, his own element. Mm-hmm. And uh, and from that point on, man, me, you know, every time I see Frankie Knuckle, he would never call me Eddie folks. He would call me Sunshine. <laughs> so, so I was like, all the cats in the in the truck. Even Ken would start calling me Sunshine. I said, come on, Ken, what's up? But they would never tell me. To this day, before Ken died, he would always laugh. And I was like, you know, Robert Trotman finally told me, like, maybe 20 years later. I said, man, why everybody uh, call me Sunshine? But on that trip, it's only two people living, me and, me and Rob. Everybody else passed away. He said, man, because when you was in a DJ booth, you were in the corner. And your eyes was like this. You know what I'm saying? Because I ain't never seen no shit like that. <laughs> so they said your eyes was like sunshine. You know the sunshine trying to like the sun. So they started calling me sunshine. So literally, I'm telling you, man, Frankie Knuckles had never called me Eddie Fox. He like, hey, what's up, sunshine? And he just bust out laughing. And this is going on for like, shit, you know how old I am. That's like, what? It's been a long time. So, you know, but, you know, it was all in fun and games, man. I never took it personal. I never took it personal. But that was, that was, that trip right there, man, uh, to experience, you know, like, it wasn't no kids there, man. But the whole thing was just to experience another DJ doing it at another level. We were still at this level. He was at this level with the sounds, the lights. He had a sound guy. He had his, I forgot about the light guy. And, man, that boy was getting down. And it wasn't like. People coming in disturbing that motherfucker. He was getting, his, he was getting, his, he was getting a man. I mean, he was working it with that, with that train, with the, with that, with the horn of the train. Man, he was killing him. So that was, I would say, that's my Larry LeVan. You know, I, I didn't go to see Larry LeVan, but Frankie Knuckles was my man. Funny guy too. That's dope. That's yeah. dope. That's dope. 
guys, I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to take a quick break from our interview with Eddie and get into our second hot pick. So this second one is called Feeling Fine on City Boy Music, Eddie Folks. say i'm not going to say the berlin years but just kind of like your first trips to berlin and 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 like i guess the work you did with 3mb now what was like just being a cat from detroit and going over there like what was that like then man because uh you know seeing how berlin now is the capital and uh, not you know just kind of the home of dance music on a certain level what was it like when they when it wasn't, you know, and, and they were searching for sounds, or as I understand it, if I'm wrong, help me understand, please. What was it like? I mean, it was um, I was Chazor third release because you are with Jeff Mills and Mike was over there first, then Blake was over there, but at that point, Blake didn't release with them as of yet. I think he was in the process. So, uh, but I think Blake was down with Mike and them doing it. And uh, Mike had put me on to them cats anyway, Mike Banks. And uh, so, you know, they had put my stuff out. And uh, and Dimitri would literally come to Detroit. And uh, he would stay at my place. And then I would stay at Stella place. This is before we got married. And uh, so that's how I made Dimitri got cool. And then um, he said, uh, you know, you want to come to Berlin? I said, yeah, why not? You know what I'm saying? I really wasn't trying to do all that. You know, I was just trying to do my thing in Detroit because I love the vibe in Detroit. So when I went over there, it was like, it was like when the wall went down, like, like I say about maybe literally bro, like four months after the wall went down. And it was like, I'm in the studio with Moritz Von Oswell and Thomas Feldman. And, and uh, believe it or not, Thomas Feldman, no, Morris Von Oswald used to follow me and Juan at the New Music Seminar in New York. And Juan was like, them cats keep following us. And uh, it was, excuse me, it was Tom, it was Mark, I mean, it was uh, uh, Mark. Uh, Mark Anestis? No, well, no. It was Mark Anestis and, 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 uh, and Morris that was following us, not knowing that I'm going to be in the studio with this cat three years later. You feel me? I had met him previously. So when Dimitri told them, because they had the best studio at Berlin at the time, they're making the style of music, would you like to do a project with Eddie? And then that's when uh, the guy from the Orb, Thomas Feldman, jumped in. So we all three. And I said, 3MB, hey, fuck it. Like, you know, uh, I mean, I said, like, you know, three motherfuckers in Berlin. That's how we got the 3MB project. So the, the project, the same thing, with it rotated with Juan with 3MB and Blake Baxter with 3MB. So that's what 3MB means. But the, the climate was, it, it was deep underground, but it wasn't aggressive underground. It was more like uh, the, the West Germans and the East German coming across, and this is new. You know, it's just new. So them seeing Black folks is like this, you know, and they want to touch your hair, touch your skin. That was the part that fucked me up the most, is that part, you know. And I was like, damn. So, but I had to realize, you know, where you know how many years they only you know they couldn't come across the wall, but it was cool. But it it was it was more like uh, to me I felt uh, it was it was like new, but it was like it was desolate but new because everything was happening on the east. I didn't even, even I didn't even venture in the west. I stayed in the east because the east was cool. It was more laid back. Smoke. I was smoking a bunch of hash back then, man. I don't smoke that shit no more. But I, was, but I was smoking it over there because it was cool, you know. But the the, the scene was cool, man. It, but it wasn't a lot. It was it wasn't plentiful. So everybody hung out at Hardwax, you know, buy records. 
And then whoever had parties, you know, you kind of go to. And then you had Chazor parties. But that was the only club. You had, like, another club. I can't remember the name club. It was three clubs. But it wasn't plentiful as it is now. And the scene was just, it was new. It was just new. And uh, Detroit rocked it. We came over. Everybody started producing. And then it just took off. It just it just took off. But it wasn't, like, no uh, pomp and shit. You know, everybody was... But it wasn't no popping shit from Detroit artists. It was just everybody like, hey, man, you know, they really digging that, just the sound, the Detroit sound. You know what I mean? It was it was new. I, you know, it was new. All I can say, man, it was new. And I've never seen so many Mercedes businesses in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, and then like, and today, you know, even though it's the pandemic, I mean, it seems like uh, in addition to kind of the energy that you've been having doing DJ sets and putting out music, but also some of your boys like Norm, Norm Talley, he, he and Delano, they did, uh, were doing hot stuff with the mix, you know, live virtual stuff, as well as Omar S now is doing like stuff with Red Bull. Like, man, can you describe like some of the people that really you see are putting in work right now despite the pandemic? Who do I see? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know. Or do or do you not see nobody else putting in work? Uh, I mean, yeah, I see cats putting in work. Uh, Mink's putting in some work. She putting her, she's putting her irons in the fire. For sure. You know, uh, I think I, I think overall, you know, even a, even the Godfather himself, he called me a couple of days ago, asked me a question about some mini shit. He putting in work. I think, I, I think at a certain point, man, I think a lot of people were just stunned because they could they was at a standstill. But I think as the more that vaccine kicked in, or, you know, in the, in the light at the end of the tunnel, I think a lot of cats was like, like, hey, man, I might as well, you know, start, you know, preparing myself for the, you know, for the light of the, you know, the end of the tunnel for the shit can manifest itself back to the normalcy that we were, you know. I mean, only thing what I see is what you see on Facebook, you know. I put it this way. A lot of cats on if you do that shit on social media, social media, you get kind of worn off. So, so I think some people pulling back and then coming back, you know, doing some, some sets. Because I haven't done no live joint in a minute, because it's like, you know, sometimes, you know, it's because the competition is so thick out there. You know what I mean? So it's like you can't really track your numbers. You can, but you can't really see if it's correlating to, to sales on the digital or the final side. You know what I mean? Because everything is fucking closed, you know? And, you know, if people want to stream, they're streaming like, hey. So, but as people putting in work, I mean, I only see what I see on Facebook. Um, Earl McKinney was putting in work when it first started. He was he was banging in a minute. He was banging in. Bruce, Bruce, he was banging in the boys putting in work. But I'm talking, you talking about music or just DJ? Just, you know, the cult, just the scene right now, you know? And, you know, like you said, man, Minx is putting in work. Uh, Earl definitely early on was, you know, causing people to have some issues just with just with how he was banging and hitting them out the bat, you know. What you mean uh, issues? No, I'm just saying, uh, like you could tell that uh, cats, like Earl brought the heat early and he had the visuals. Just cats had to step their games. <laughs> Cat, you know, Delano and them had the visuals. You just couldn't come out the, with the bad audio and shit like that. Like, right. immediately, some dudes came in with some, like, levels of production value, right? Right. I mean, just from what I saw. And uh, that became, like, what, for a minute, all Cats was going after. Like, I got to get my audio right. I got to get some visuals. And then, like... Everybody, like at that point, that's where, you know, everybody's got the same equipment. But it took a minute before that technology just got democratized in a way that Joe Blow or just your uh, guys that you really wasn't seeing was able to kind of like up their social media profile and start mixing. So, yeah, you know. I, I had to invest in three cameras because you, you didn't know what the future was like. And it's mm-hmm. like, I'd be down if I'm sitting here and just twiddle my thumbs. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I got the, the the green, I got the white screen. I got all that shit. But I just haven't manifest that shit yet. I'm just like, okay, cool. It's cool to have. But it's cool It's cool to have in your, your arsenal. Okay, you know, hey, I feel like doing some shit. And 
uh, have a camera to, to show me doing some work, some um, music work, which I never had before. So, you know, it's not a waste. It's just how you implement that, you know, as you, you know, continue in your process and this stuff. But yeah, you, you know, I had to, you know, step up my game. And a lot of people, a lot of cats didn't, 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 didn't have sound cards too, you know what I'm saying? And they didn't know how to run that mixer through that sound card. And, you know, and they didn't know how to record it. Because first I had to use my iPhone, but it was working. But I had to, I had to sit here and do some research to get a good, learn how to get a good quality. Because most of that shit was off my iPhone. You know what I'm saying? I had to, things I had to do and buy some certain chords where the audio would be kind of crisp clear. But now I flipped it over, you know, investing some shit. And now, I, you know, I can do it at another level if I want to. That's if I want to. But it's cool. I just, you know, man, I just like banging. I don't, I, you know, I'm not really into the thrills of, you know, the background. But I did. But but anyway, I just like to just put my record on and, and play my records. Because I'm really like more into vinyl now, man. I'm kind of like passing on that digital shit. I'm tired of the dancing DJs. Mm. I want to yeah. work with my money. I honestly think that, you know, playing vinyl is, it's, you put in work, you know, you you know, you 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 are to me you're a true DJ. That's just my opinion. Guys, I hope uh you are enjoying this interview with Mr. Eddie Folks. We're gonna take another quick break to hear our third hot pick, which is called X Groove by Mr. Eddie Folks on City Board Music. You was early on, you was really participating in after George Floyd, man. Just you was on the front lines a little bit, just with the uh protest about his death and Black Lives Matter and stuff. You really uh, you know, kind of didn't sit on the sidelines during that. What made you get out there in the street? You know, so it's kind of personal to me. You know, you can't hide behind your turntables and shit like that. So if you don't stand for shit, what do you stand for? You know, you making good music and DJing, that shit's going to cut through all that shit. You see Jeff Mills, he stood up. You know what I'm saying? He stood up. So a lot of people across the world will see this, but they wouldn't understand it because you have to live it. And if you don't live it, you wouldn't understand it. You know, and some DJs didn't, you know, they, they, they never came across, you know, shit like this. You know, so it's like, welcome to America. So don't judge me or us when we make music that about our culture. You have to use it in a good way to make good music and make money off of it. But at the same time, be articulate and understand the law when this occur in your face. But man, I kind of hear this this energy though that you're talking about in your music, especially the uh, the music that you did with Jeff Mills, speaking of Jeff Mills, who you brought up, and Jessica Care Moore and the beneficiaries. You know, you brought in Sundiata. Like those records have a real, like a real Afro feel. You know, talk to me about, you know, those records that you made. I like the people's, you know, I was listening to that earlier. Yeah, me and Jeff, uh, you know, we, we uh, he can't remember, but we made uh, some cuts like in the 80s, uh, a couple of cuts. But, you know, that's still my dog, Jeff, my dog. And, uh, you know, as you know, I, you know, he went his way, went my way, but we still kept in contact. I think was this, this, we started talking three years ago about this. And he said, yeah, let's get down. And then, um. He mentioned Jessica Moore, and Jessica, my girl now, I mean, you know, but at the time I didn't know who she was. <laughs> and she was so cool. We all was in the studio here in Detroit, and uh, then we took the parts, and then we, you know, uh, and took it home, and we kind of filled it. And, you know, Amp, he played on there too. So I I did a lot of recording over Amp House in his studio, and Sundiata brought the, the percussions because I wanted, you know, he's older than me. You know, he's like my, you know, he's our elder. And, you know, and sometimes you got to let a brother, you know, play with your, you know, bring you back to his African spirits. If you can touch, well, you can't touch because you don't know where you come from. So you have to feel those those percussions. So when he played, it was like he had his eyes closed. Like he, he got down and you felt it because he felt what Jessica was playing. 
So we all kind of morph around each other, you know, to, to, for that people record. Everybody felt it, man, because it was more like taking you out of the, the ram of the of the flow of the dance music that we've been making for years. It was just something different. So, no, it had, it had like a little Tony Allen feel, you know what I'm saying? It, it had like a different feel. And uh, speaking of different feels, like I also, uh, the local Dice record, you yeah. know? I really, uh, I like that. Uh, I played funk yeah. on a, a radio show I did in Chicago, man. Man, talk to me about your relationship with Local Dice and what went into making that project, because I saw some videos. Man, you guys really seem like to have a good synergy. Honestly, I met Dice. It was me, Dice, Richie Hart, and Carl Craig on a panel. And I had never heard of the guy. And he was so cool, you know, we got along. So... He said, man, next time you come with you, let's, let's get together. And I said, okay, bet. And we did some dates. And then um, I wasn't thinking about making no music. He was like, hey, man, let's get to make some tracks. And I said, okay, cool. So honestly, this has been going on for like four years now of us, you know, slowly. So he submit, I submit, until we rounded off like, you know, what we want to put out, you know what I'm saying? And then we did final all the music in Dusseldorf, you know, you know. I was there mixing and stuff. He was mixing it. But it took time because he wants to make it a project, you know, not just throw it, uh, throw it out, see if stick on a wall, you know. But the sad part, we didn't really promote it a lot, lot, lot because of COVID. You know what I'm saying? We couldn't really do a lot of interviews. We did what we could. All that video you saw was pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. That's how it was. But it still was overall it was a good project, man. And uh, a lot of people, you know, you know, a lot of people dug the project, man. A lot of people. No, I, I'm I'm one of those people, man. And then uh, I see through EPM, you got the City Boy EPs. It's, you know, it's like volume one, two, and three. It's it's some heaters on there, man. Like I like past and present, uh, knucklehead kicking it off, and then like X Groove, like has like like some little like electro elements or more like even those futuristic sounds. Like man, talk to me about the difference between these volumes and just how it, this City Boy EP came about? I mean, it was just like, you know, I'm trying to hit both sides of the aisle, you know, with the, the wax and then the City Boy. Now, I don't want to press two record labels. I said, I'm going to do the City Boy on digital, but keep the original City Boy that came out on vinyl as it is. Mm -hmm. And then uh, keep Detroit wax. And my DJ room here, I just like, I'm going to buy a new gear right here. And I've been messing with that for since 18 slowly 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 you know master the shit you know the shit like the back of your hand and slowly you know do it where it's like the machine is my personality you know it's the, the new mp mm -hmm. mpcx i had nice. it for like yeah i saw am filling with it <laughs> i went and got it like two months later after he had it instead of that uh project sit on the shelf here's the digital outlet i can use Plus, you know, every, every, you know, everybody's streaming now. It's just something to keep flowing out there. I, I mean, as far as the, the techno and all that stuff, you know, it wasn't no set in stone what direction. I just like, okay, cool. Let's run with this, run with that. Also, uh, I see you scoring films. Talk, talk to me about that process, working with Jake Alexander and scoring films. Man, Jake is a funny guy, man. That's my dog. I mean, he's silly, though. A good guy. <laughs> but, yeah, man, that was... Uh, Trey Estacios and Steam and I mean the, the last one and it's like uh, and Johnny Cash's daughter they all get to hear my music that was the cool part the money was cool the money was cool I ain't gonna complain about the money it's really like sitting and talking to the director and then and really like going over the script and Jake what makes the Jake easy he lets me flow you know he not on my back on my neck he just let me flow and then I get to film as it coming in, and then I'm I, I make my intro. I work. I don't I don't have a final edit. As the final edit comes, then I adjust, and it works perfectly for me. So it's like it's like being in the studio doing a remix with people, man. You know, make changes. So the patience is the patience, man. Yeah, Yo, you out to uh, Juan and Kevin. Anybody lately? Just Blake. Juan. Just Juan. Just Juan. Yeah, just Juan. Kevin called me a couple times. I, I didn't get the chance. I didn't get actually I didn't get a chance to call him back. <laughs> he probably mad at me, but <laughs> I didn't call him back. He hit me up twice. So 
I just, you know, man, you know, kids home, you know, from college, they can't, you know, this stuff, type of shit going on. You know, my wife is an ER nurse, man. I ain't trying to catch that shit. You know, so everything is, it's a lot of moving parts here at this house, man. Mm. A lot of moving parts, bro. And so that vaccine, you know, it's kicks in, you know, I think, uh, well, I would say, how about this? I would say that vaccine, when that motherfucker vaccine kick in, it's like the longevity, like how long is going to last? That's the whole key. Nobody, you know, nobody never said that. So that's like, wow, how is this going to change the game? Like you take the vaccine, you only can travel for three months. And this country said you got to have a certain vaccine to get in this country, this country, that country. And it's just going to be haywire. It's going to be crazy, you know, because oh. there's so much money involved with it, too. So, you know, then you got to say, you got to look at it this way, too. The promoter's going to say, well, hey, man, we estimating so many kids. So now they trying to, you know, they might might suppress your money on your gigs now because a lot is, is not full throttle like it used to be. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's a lot of variables, man. You know, it's, it's a lot of variables with this shit. So it goes back to your question of putting in work, you know, you know, like, hey, fuck it. I got music. I got my table. You know, I can curate a, a key content going. That's my word I'm trying to say. Well, man, it's, this show is, like I said, for uh, 2021, the first day of 2021. What do you set out to really do in 2021, man? What's what, what's your mission? My mission in 21 is to, since COVID hit, I have made a lot of connections. And it was, it's kind of cool. So I just want to manifest that even more. You know, like, I, want, I really want to do more film scores. You know, you know, I already got three and um i really want to do more of that in 21 because it's, it's fun and it's cool it's it's all that man I, I think that shit is fun you know i really do because then i think about like damn the film score 12 inches and shit they not at that level you know what i'm saying so it's like you know all that shit man that the, that quincy jones did man i understand not at this level don't get me wrong i'm, I'm small potatoes but just to understand i mean the ins and outs and then run at to some some deep minimal you know tracks you know what I'm saying just it's just your mind is just constantly working with music and stuff. Can I be the dance music film for a king? I hope so. It, it, but I tell you this with Jake, you know, that that last thing he did in, in uh it was the New York uh it, New York Central Park Festival. Yeah that when he turned into a film man that opened up a lot of doors for that boy. And I'm, I'm glad for him. Hopefully he keep me, you know, as a sound guy. I mean, a, a, a film score cat, man, you know, on, on some of his projects. It just works. Because a lot of people don't hear that type of music every day. They'll think that when you see some black kids, you're going to hear some hip hop. But it was the opposite I put in there. Mm-hmm. You feel me? And it just kind of make people think like, man, you know, you don't have to uh, compartmentalize music. Music is, can be used for everything, you know? You can use country music if you're doing an independent film in Detroit about black kids. You just gotta know how to place it. Everything don't have to be because you black, you gotta make jazz. If you black, you gotta make hip hop. You black, you gotta be R&B. You don't have to do that, man. You can just be yourself and let you, you know, and just like, hey, I wanna do something different, you know? And and to me, you know, being different keep you around a long time, you know? <clears throat> can't just play fucking techno all day. I, I can't. I mean, make it all day because it's no fun. You get bored. I take that back. Why? I'm the only person I know who can do it well. That's dope, man. I uh, again, man. I I thank you. I thank you for uh, taking this time, and more importantly, I, again, we wouldn't be here at this point without you. Do you know? Much love and uh, respect to you and Stella and the family, man. Uh, I appreciate you. You know. All right, man. You're welcome. Welcome. I hope you feel like I do, but that was an awesome interview. Such great information from our brother, Mr. Eddie Folks. From the legendary Techno 6, we affectionately refer to him as. Anyway, let's get into this next one. The fourth hot pick by Mr. Eddie Folks is called You Know on City Boy Music.
This is DJ 3000. I met Eddie Folks back in like 96, 97. Um, and when I started MoTeC with my friend Sean Snell, uh, Eddie Folks was actually the first person to give us tracks. Um, not only that, but Eddie was uh, really helpful and just uh, he helped guide us a little bit, you know, when we needed uh, advice on just the label. When we first started making tracks, you know, when we were buying equipment, he was always uh, there to within a within a just a just a phone call he was always uh giving you know and that's one thing um i think that everybody would say about eddie folks i mean he's been there since day one he's a legend but also he was always there when you need him i mean for a phone call for you know i'm looking at this keyboard or uh a studio or advice or gigs djing whatever uh he was always there to lend a hand and uh uh yeah eddie that's my man Yo, this is Antonio Eccles from Detroit, mostly known for recent San Antonio projects back in the day, the first generation of techno family. I started off wanting to DJ, listening to Eddie Folks. Eddie Folks, amongst others, Al Esther, Steve Dunbar, etc., Jeff Mills, but Eddie Folks is the one that got me wanted to DJ and do music. He used to uh, come in parties, U of D parties, and I, I, he walk in and I hear people whispering his name, Eddie Folks, there go Eddie Folks. He used to make records sound three times better than what it was. He used to triple. He's the first DJ that I heard triple. He used to do this classic uh, with Reach Up, Tony Lee. That always blew my mind. Great DJ, great friend, great producer. Peace. Hey guys, that was Santonio Echoes. He too is a part of the legendary Techno Six here in Detroit. Speaking of legendary, up next, one of the originators of Techno, Mr. Kevin Saunderson. This is Kevin Saunderson, and I ran into Eddie encountered Eddie folks up at Eastern Michigan University, probably 1983, I believe. Um, you know, some early part of 1983. Eddie uh, was hanging around some friends, of, mutual friends of ours, Art Payne, Keith Martin. They had 1,200 turntables. Uh, so everybody kind of went to their apartment to mess around and practice mixing and listen to music. They just had the top of the line stuff and then we all just kind of met there. So that's how I met Eddie. Uh, I actually ended up living with Eddie for a short period of time. Um, Eddie, he was a hard worker and probably one of the best DJs I had heard at that moment in time, especially during the campus parties. He was like amazing to me, fearless, played the right tune at the right moment. Um, so I was inspired by Eddie, you know, as a DJ. Um, and this is before, obviously, I started DJing. It was the beginning of me wanting to be a DJ. Uh, I only heard of a couple people before then, like Al Lester, uh, John Collins at Cheeks, you know. Um, and... I mean, I heard people like in New York, like Larry the Van, but it was a totally different style. So Eddie, he was, you know, the guy. I would go to his parties, help carry equipment, do whatever I had to do to be a part of the, the crew as I was learning. And uh, Eddie was amazing in playing two records at one time. He would take, start, I remember Honeybee, his record called Honeybee. I don't remember... Uh, who who made it, but uh, he would always start this record over at the right time and, and start the beginning with two copies, and it was just so, so powerful when he did that. Um, but as I got to know Eddie and lived with him, uh, he started making music as we all followed Juan, as Derek, myself, Blake Baxter, uh, Santonio, Shake, Anthony Shake, 
all of that, you know, um, he was making music too. And Eddie, uh, you know, when we first started mix music, we all kind of collaged around each other when we made music because we would share equipment. Like if I had a drum machine and Eddie wanted to use it or uh, somebody wanted to use it, uh, synthesizer, we would just bring it over. And as that person was working on music, we just hanging out, doing nothing, you know, listening to some music and headphones, just hanging out, right? But uh, Eddie was a, a hard worker in there, working that equipment. Um, he uh, played on train. He, he did some 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 extra drum programming on Triangle Love. I think he did. He he uh, did the snare roll, so uh, that's one of my first records. You know, just you know, you just let somebody jump in if they want to do something. That's just how we did it. Uh, um, and then eventually Eddie had his own record, Goodbye Kiss, which again I think Juan had a, a role in it, trying to get it finished. And you know, we we know how to put the pieces down the music, but we didn't know how to finish music. We didn't know how to get it to the point where you can get it, uh, so you can get it to vinyl and all that. But Juan was stuck. He, he showed Eddie the path and helped Eddie finish his first record. Uh, and when I heard Goodbye Kiss, I was blown away. I couldn't believe this record. It was the baddest record I heard, you know, in Detroit at the time, you know. Um, and I didn't know what I had to do with it at the time, but Eddie, uh, you know, big record, huge record. Um, that was Eddie's biggest record, in my opinion, and his best record he ever made. Eddie's always been a good brother. That's what I can say about Eddie and what I know about him and what have I experienced with him over the years. We've had a, a, a good relationship really all the time. No battles, no fights. Of course, sometimes we might have disagreed, but uh, mutual respect for each other. Up next, we'll hear from our brother, one of my favorite DJs from the D, Mr. Norm Talley. Well, first of all, Eddie is a character within himself. <laughs> you know, he's always, you know, he's a comedian. He's got a good sense of humor. A lot of people may not know that, but he has a real good sense of humor, you know. Uh, you know, a lot of people may take him seriously, but a lot of times he just be joking, man, you know, and he's funny. So, you know, just that alone, you know, hanging with him, you know, he always be telling jokes and this and that. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's, it's fun to hang, you know, hang with him, you know, but then on the serious side, you know, he ain't joking when it comes to his business either. Now, if his business, you know, he could be straight up 100 with you, you know, and you might not be ready to handle that. You know what I mean? So it's two different sides. You know what I mean? It joke around with you all day. But now if it comes to some bookings or some records or something like that, you're going to keep it 100 and put it down. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. you got to be ready for that. And sometimes that might be a little bit too much for somebody. They might not be able to take it. You know, somebody, you know, just keep it 100, not sugarcoat nothing. Telling you straight up, this is what I want. This is how I want it done. Boom, boom, boom. Make it happen. Goodbye, Kiss. It was funky, first of all. You know what I mean? And it crossed over, you know, just from like not just house crowds or not just techno crowds. It crossed over to the mainstream. So, you know, I would say that's all around a good record, you know. A lot of people uh, just listen to the record and may not know that it's Eddie, folks. They just like the record. It's a good record. You know, it's good music, period, you know. And it's funky, you know. Everybody loves some funky music. Definitely a Detroit classic, most definitely. I mean, it's a classic worldwide, but it's most definitely a Detroit classic, first and foremost, because this is where it was born. Actually, folks, you know, taught a lot of people, along with myself, the business of the game, you know, which is important because a lot of people don't know the business of the game. So Eddie has been, you know, one of the ones on the forefront teaching people the business of the game. That's that's very important. You know, a lot of people in the business, but they don't know the game, you know? So that was, uh, he was kind of instrumental in doing that, you know, 
earlier for a lot of artists, you know, he taught them, you know, to keep your publishing, keep your masters, you know, this is your music, you own it, you know, even if you license it, you can get it back and you can resell it, you know. So that's part of the business of where you can survive for the rest of your life and your kids can collect on your royalties, you know? So that's very important, you know? Yeah. You know, that, that, that was, that was good, man. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we are, that we're doing this because, you know, any um, folks or, what uh, what they called him back in the day, Eddie Flashing folks. Um, he's certainly an unsung hero in the whole scheme of things as it relates to you know techno. Um, you know, I know for me personally, Eddie. Um, you know, once you get to to know him as a person, he he's a giver. And, um, and, and, and that's one quality that I've always appreciated, um, you know, about Eddie and that he, he, he was a giver. He's a, he's a, he's a sharer. Cause I think so many times in this industry, um, you, uh, sometimes there can be just so much hate and division, um, you know, people fail to realize that there is plenty of opportunity out there, you know, and I, I remember Eddie, Eddie, uh, there was, I was trying to get into, um, get my music in video games. And Eddie was the one that turned me on to this guy out of London. And my music almost got into, it was a real popular game called, um, um, Big Planet, I, you know, I'm sure you all probably not familiar, but it was a really popular video game by Sony. And I got like real close. Music was there and everything. And then they pulled it at the last minute. I was mad as hell. Because <laughs> back then, you know, they were they were making people uh, uh, rich with those video games. Then they then everybody started licensing their music and they were like, oh, we got to stop this. Everybody caught on, but I digressed. But, uh, you know, I appreciate this, man. Eddie made some real valid points. You know, the whole going to the beginning as an artist. And I know not everyone. I know everyone as an artist is, is, is not like this. And that's cool. But, you know, I just feel personally as an artist that if you have a platform. That you should use that platform to express those things that are going on in the world. You know what I mean? Like music is, is, is one of those things that, 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 that influences uh, the world. And, you know, when you have a platform like a Jeff Mills, like a Eddie folks, like a Juan Atkins, you know, especially in, in dance music and using that platform to speak about social injustices across the board. You know, I, I, I feel Eddie on that, you know, um, art imitates life, you know, and uh, so I can appreciate and respect that point, um, you know, that he brought up. He got to talking about that equipment, man. It brought back memories, bro. I, you know, it was like, shit, I was one of those cats, too, that didn't have the 1200. You know, my shit was technique SLB 200s <laughs> with the and the pitch was a dial. OK, and I had to use nickels that I would put on the needle arm to keep the motherfuckers from skipping, you know, when we were playing those vinyl records. You know what I mean? And then that goddamn realistic radio. My cousin worked at Radio Shack. Y'all remember that show back in the day? My cousin worked at Radio Shack, dog. And that was my first mixer. It was a it was called it was a realistic. It was called realistic. Realistic mixer. And they had faders on them. I think it only had like maybe four goddamn channels. And the Q button was like a fucking switch that you would like click back back and forth and shit with your fingers, you know. 
Man, those those were the days, bro. Those were the days. But he said it, man. You know, shit. You got creative. You know what I mean? And like, you know, during the eighties, those of us coming up as DJs, man. You know, you had to cut your teeth, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like when you DJ those parties, dude, your shit had to be right. You know what I mean? I remember cats like damn near like putting their head in the speakers to make sure your blends was tight. You know what I'm saying? Like you spent hours making sure that your transition from record to record was good because you knew when you went to that hall in front of hundreds of kids, black kids that loved fucking progressive music, your shit better be right, bro. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. You feel me? Yeah, that's what's up. That's what's up. I feel you on that one. That was a good one. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No doubt. We had, we all had that realistic uh, mixer. Hell we yeah. all had the home turntable set up with some tin foil on there as a slip pad and a right. cool or a penny. You 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 had to make your slip dog. You had to make your slip pass. We, you know, we, <laughs> you, we, we, you, you remember how pass. some of the vinyl records came in like clear, like the right. clear sheets. Yeah, that was the fucking slip paper. pad, dog. And you know what I'm saying? Slip, Come on, now talk to me. I, you know, I I remember <laughs> we would we do that, and then Kyle say would come up and he, right. he, he'd be spinning. And he advanced past me, Scott Chanel, all right. of us. And when I stopped, <laughs> and I stopped. I was like, I ain't even messing with it. That kid's too good. <laughs> you know, so we were all there. <laughs> no, that slip pad was that plastic and an album cover. Yeah. You know, like you would cut it, put your little hole in it so it would fit on the turntable and shit, put, make sure the plastic was up under so that record could slide back and forth easily. That's right. Bruh, come on now. Uh. That's what's up. I'm about to start tearing up in this motherfucker. <laughs> Talking about that. It's nostalgia, <laughs> baby. That's what nostalgia. Yeah. Key. But yeah. you know, it, it, you know, it's advanced so much, you know. Right. I, I, I was right. I was really um I mean, you know, if if we can move into gear, that was what caught my attention when he started talking about um, you know, working with amp, you know, because that's a solid connection between you know the just seeing how amp has transitioned from teaching jay dilla the mpc and then we got eddie folks building with him now and eddie going out and buying the latest mpc x after working with amp again right see how that shit come full circle that mentoring that full circle right amp taught Jay Dilla one of the biggest hip hop right. beat makers in the world and right. then he touches Eddie Folks and Eddie right. Folks flips his rig to the right. MPC because that's the legacy that we pass on right. as and, artists in Detroit. Right. And you know I, I I think as Detroit artists we get so caught up in our own shit that we forget how important collaboration is. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, there, there, you know, there are a lot of talented Detroit artists and we need to start collaborating more, especially in these days and times. You That's know what I mean? Key. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, we have some brilliant producers, man, that come out of Detroit, man. And, yeah. You know, cats need to start, you know, collaborating more, you know, putting out right. compilations and eps and, let's, right let's make that our first resolution collaborate hey. more we need right. to collaborate right. more work with right. each other you even know if it's across zoom even if right. it's across the world right collaborate you know it's enough opportunity out here for everyone man you know put your fucking ego in your back pocket and let's fucking collaborate man make some hot shit you know that's what's up you know i agree with you 100 percent you know. But yeah, that, that that was great, Christian. That was that was great, man. That was great. You and know, you Eddie me. Eddie definitely can put a perspective, you know, give a different perspective on on the scene. You know what I mean? Because he was there. You know, he lived it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I was. I'm so um, happy that he and Jeff Mills collaborated on a project together. Yeah. 
you know, yeah, he, yeah. he, when he talked about being different, um, you know, being different and, and, and challenging, challenging yourself as an artist, man, you know, expanding your horizons, going into different territories of creation, you know, that's, that's, that's what it's all about, man. You know, I, I know yeah. that's what it's all about for me. Um, you know, not just staying in one lane, but for him to collaborate with Jeff, man, that, that was, that was awesome. That says a lot about Jeff, you know, reaching back. Um, and it also says a lot about Eddie, um, pushing himself, you know, as an artist, you know, you know, I've always felt that Jeff was that revolutionary artist, um, you know, for me, he was like that first um, techno artist that, you know, ventured into scoring, you know, which I thought was amazing. Then, you know, taking it to that whole level of of a full fledged orchestra playing techno music. I mean, you know, that's just incredible, man. Jeff Mills touched a lot of people, influenced a lot of people. You know, whether you were a DJ or not, you know what I mean? Uh, if you heard Jeff Mills, the wizard on the radio, you know, you were touched by that. Uh, you know, speaking of radio, when, when Eddie talked about his trip to Chicago, I remember I was like 10th grade, man. And my parents took me to Chicago. You know, by that time I was DJing and I was like, mom, turn the radio on. WBMX, man, I heard that shit and heard that house music playing, man. That shit blew me away. I was like, damn, they playing house music on commercial radio. And that's crazy. You know, WBMX, man. Yes. Chicago. But yeah, man, salute to Eddie, man. Salute to Eddie, folks. Eddie flashing, folks. Yeah, and you know, I was really um, excited when I heard that Beneficiaries album came out. You know, with uh, you know, with Jeff, Jessica, Care Moore, and Eddie. Like that's a that's a beast of a pair. You know, Jessica lyrics right. alone. You right. know, she's gonna give you you know what she gives you. And I didn't know Sundiata AD was on there. So, you know, Sundiata. You know, we got. I didn't know that either. Sundiata. Yeah, yeah, that's another brother, uh, another unsung hero uh, from the scene. You know, that has Live a wealth from of with house. Mm -hmm. that's the, mm -hmm. the realness that's yeah. where it happened that's what you know house yeah. was about having a every once in a while there's the live drummer there and bringing right. it back to the motherland bringing it back mm -hmm. to you know mm -hmm. ancestral rhythms and that's so he right. connected on that and i was glad to hear him say that because every once in a while you got to get away from the from the um, you know from the electronic drums and get right. into the real drums you know man i was so glad to hear eddie talk about how he has fallen back in love with vinyl, you know, I mean, like, shit, that's how we were all raised, man. You know what I mean? Like it took me a long time to start playing CDs. I remember I, I, I was doing, I did a party with uh, Kai and I had all, I had a big ass billfold of CDs and Kai was like, yo man, you know, you can put all that shit on thumb drive now. <laughs> And I was just like, yo, dude, I can't I can't do it because for me, flipping through that billfold, and I know this may sound crazy, but flipping through that billfold of CDs, dog, was like flipping through them fucking records in a milk crate. You see what I'm saying? I'm searching. It's the process. You feel me? Right. <laughs> it's muscle memory, right? It's triggering right. memories. It's, it's, it's the it process, down. bruh. And I know uh, there are arguments on both sides, you know, times have changed. You know what I mean? And I love some vinyl all day. I really do. You, you know, we, 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 we are all very fortunate, man, and blessed to, to be a part of this situation because this is, this is history in the making, man. And we cannot, I know, you know, we can't take this shit lightly, man. This is the kind of shit that that, you know, my kids, kids, kids will see and learn from. You know what I mean? So, you know, I, I just think that, you know, we're, we're, we're on that right path of just making sure that, you know, our story is handled properly and and that we 
um, tell it with truth um, and love and respect. You know what I mean? Guys, our final hot pick before we wrap up the show. Still with Mr. Eddie Folks. This track is called Something Special, E, on 4 to the Floor Records. Support the independent filmmaking process and buy merch from us at the gsgdm.com website for the holiday season. All of our old merch is 20% off. Shout out to Shannon in Kentucky, Mikkel and Roosevelt in Michigan, Karen in the UK, Layla in Illinois, Nicole in Dubai, Tony in Arizona, and Stuart in New Jersey for buying all that sale merch. You can also buy from our new merch collection on gsgdm.com. I want to give a shout out to our listeners in Copenhagen, Indonesia, Malta, St. Albans, and Austin, Texas. Shout out to Five Mag, Oliver, Addie, and Jonas from EPM Music. And don't forget to go ahead and check out Eddie's New Year Mix for GSGDM on our SoundCloud. Guys, we hope you enjoyed this fourth episode of God Said Give Them Drum Machines Behind the Scenes podcast featuring no other than Mr. Eddie Folks. Man, I tell you, this was a great show. Great information on Eddie and what he's doing. And we're just so honored that he took the time out of his schedule to to talk to us. Thanks, Christian Hill. That was a great interview. And speaking of the team, giving some special shout out and love and thanks to uh, Jennifer Washington and David Grandison, who also joined me today on the show. And guys, you know, don't forget, you can follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or any other streaming platform uh, where you listen to podcasts. And remember, you know, this is all about uh, building up to the documentary. So, you know, we don't want you guys to forget that in summer 2021, that is our goal for releasing the documentary. So please uh, stay updated with us on Facebook and Instagram at God Said uh, Give Them Drum Machines. Guys, thanks so much for your love. Thanks so much for your support. Uh, And remember um, that um, to whom much is given, much is required and expected in the new year. I hope you meet all of your resolutions that you uh, set before you. And um, hey, keep the faith. We thank you for your support. And remember, Detroit Techno is love. Peace.